I'm, I'm <laughs> curious how much time happens between uh, A New Hope and Rogue One. Since the release of Rogue One, there has been a constant flow of theories as to exactly how much time passes between the end of Rogue One and the beginning of A New Hope. For the most part, these predictions range from mere moments to the more lofty predictions of hours. However, in this video, I intend to make it clear that the time between the two films is, at minimum, three weeks, and more than likely much longer. So, let's get down to the evidence. Firstly, it seems much of the debate surrounding this issue is focused on the period of time spent within hyperspace, the distance between Scarif and Tatooine, and how long a direct route between these two planetary bodies would take. The most compelling of these predictions come from people with a far greater grasp of Star Wars planetary layouts and a better understanding of the Star Wars math behind Star Wars hyperspace travel than I. For example, this Reddit user who estimates that travelling from Scarif, the planet at the end of Rogue One, to Tatooine, the planet at the start of A New Hope, would take approximately 10 hours. Well that's great you may say, what a short and concise video you may well go on to add. Perhaps too hastily, because as Bale or Garner perfectly summed up, the debate is not over. You see, while on the surface it would appear that calculating a direct route between Scarif and Tatooine might be the best way to estimate the time difference, it fails to do so thanks to one very important and unsurprisingly overlooked piece of evidence. Why is it unsurprising this piece of evidence was overlooked? Well, because most people don't read every Star Wars novel, marking out possibly important parts of sticky notes like a mad person. Luckily for you, the viewer, I'm not most people. Before we get down to the quoting question, there are a few factors that we have to establish. Firstly, the ships involved. We have at the start of A New Hope, Darth Vader's Star Destroyer, the Devastator, chasing down Captain Antilles' Tantive IV. This was, in the old canon, common knowledge, and has been once more identified as such in the new canon thanks to Lost Stars. We also know that it is in fact these two same ships at the end of Rogue One. Not only because it is heavily suggested and from the perspective of a satisfying narrative makes more sense, but also because in Rogue One, Bail Organa calls the rebel ship's captain by name, and because Star Wars Rogue One The Ultimate Visual Guide identifies Vader's vessel as the Devastator. With the ships involved now identified beyond any reasonable doubt as the Devastator and Tantive IV, the evidence for a three week minimum between the two films can easily be established thanks, once more, to Lost Stars. Spanning across an extremely long period of time, the new Star Wars canon novel Lost Stars gives us a glimpse into many of the most memorable encounters throughout the franchise through the eyes of an Imperial officer, Sienna, or a rebel pilot, Thane. And, rather helpfully, one such battle is the clash between the Devastator and Tantive IV, which begins with this quote. Three weeks into her service aboard the Devastator, Sienna finally stopped feeling like a cadet imposter and started to feel like a true Imperial officer. The change came the first day she was finally thrown into action against the Rebels. Had Sienna been aboard the Devastator during the encounter at the end of Rogue One, this statement would surely not have been made, as that extraordinarily badass space battle most certainly qualifies as action. It is further unlikely that she was there and simply did not take part, both because I feel that engaging an enemy fleet is a sort of all hands on deck situation, and because even being a bystander in such a large and historically important engagement would certainly warrant at least a mention in the story of one's life. This means that between Sienna joining the crew of the Devastator, which we now know happened after Rogue One's Battle of Scarif, and her involvement in the two vessels clash at the start of A New Hope, a three week period has already passed. So if it is, as Reddit user the True J has suggested, only a short, approximately 10 hour jump from Scarif to Tatooine, why then did this rematch between the Imperial Star Destroyer Devastator and Rebellion Corvette Tandive IV take so gosh darn long? Well, to turn the question around, for what reason would an already incommissioned Star Destroyer suddenly take on Sienna and several members of her newly graduating class? It is, I believe, not a stretch of the imagination to say that despite arriving late, following the rather heated encounter above Scarif, the Devastator had to replace certain crew members that were either injured or killed during the conflict. Considering they're being pressed for time, it would make sense that the replacement crew came from whatever was readily available, namely Sienna's graduating class. Therefore, it would make sense for Sienna to be assigned to the Devastator almost immediately following the Battle of Scarif, and in fact, entirely due to the Battle of Scarif. This is one of the reasons I have suggested the time difference be a minimum of three weeks, but likely longer. 
we simply do not know how long it took, whether it be hours, days or weeks, for Sienna and her classmates to join the crew of the Devastator. If it were days, the period of time between the two fields may only be three weeks. But on the other hand, if it took a week after the conflict for the new crew to arrive, it may have been a month or longer. However, considering the importance of the stolen plans, why would the Devastator, still clearly being operational even if slightly damaged and very slightly low on crew, not immediately jump after Tandem 4? What in blazes was Darth Vader doing during this time? The answer to this comes twofold. Firstly, the Devastator didn't simply follow Tantive 4 because the Devastator did not know where Tantive 4 was going. If multiple Star Wars encounters have taught us anything, it's that tracking someone through hyperspace is not as easy as it seems. If it were, the Millennium Falcon would not have managed to, on multiple occasions, escape its pursuers doing precisely that. And once more, if it were, Darth Vader would not have literally had to place a tracker on the Millennium Falcon and then purposefully let it go in order to locate the Rebel base. So to delve into speculation territory, it seems likely that during this period between the two films, the Devastator, while the destination of Tantive 4 was unknown, underwent repairs and awaited replacement crew members. During which, and taking up the second fold of the two-fold I mentioned earlier, Darth Vader and other Imperial officers likely tortured any rebels left stranded in the scattered debris field that now orbited Scarif. Eventually, one of the tortured rebels must have known Tantive 4's destination and spilled the proverbial beans. As evidence from Vader in A New Hope stating this, I have traced the rebel spies to her. This might sound like it solved the issue. However, you may still have that nagging voice in the back of your head, protesting, but grim. If it only takes approximately 10 hours to travel from Scarif to Tatooine, why then were the rebels not long gone by the time the Imperials got there three weeks later? Well, let's get into that. To answer that, we first have to understand the nature of hyperspace travel within the Star Wars universe. Very simply, it is moving from point A to point B really, really fast. However, between those two points, there must be empty space, which we know because of this scene where Han warns Luke. Without precise calculations, we fly right through a star and then it injured trip real quick. What this means is that traveling from point A to point B is often not as simple as that. And it is more commonly traveling from point A to E, where points B, C, and D are smaller, necessary stops in which you must drop out and re-enter hyperspace along the way in order to avoid obstacles. It is for this reason that the map to Skywalker in Star Wars Episode 7 isn't just a straight line. This is why the Millennium Falcon's Kessel Run record is something worth bragging about, with 12 parsecs being caused by an impressively small amount of jumps along the way, thereby resulting in a shorter distance overall travelled, despite the fact that the start and destination of the run, as the eagle flies, never changed. A more precise route equals less distance, less jumps, and finally it thereby results in a shorter travel time. To explain why this is relevant to the subject at hand, we must invoke both the prequels and the Clone Wars series, and start talking about hyperspace lanes. What is a hyperspace lane? Well, once again, since the resetting of the canon, it is hard to find a quote that explains it fully. But essentially, they are large, safe areas for hyperspace travel between important places, which thereby rule out the necessity of making multiple smaller jumps. The issue with these lanes is that they can be controlled Droid Army has seized control of the major hyperspace lanes which can cause major issues separating the Republic from the majority of its clone army. The ability to close off hyperspace lanes is also why, as many people protested, the Trade Federation's blockade in the Phantom Menace is not fully encircling the planet Naboo. It does not need to do so as successfully blockading the entrance to the hyperspace lane essentially cuts the planet off from the rest of the galaxy. And we know that this is in fact what they were doing because, in order to escape, the Queen ship had to fly directly towards and through said blockade. Further, as we know by the end of the Clone Wars, both the Republic and the Separatists were essentially puppet factions controlled by the future Emperor. And since, as the Clone Wars series informs us, most of these hyperspace lanes were controlled by either the Republic or the Separatists, we can only assume that following the end of the war and creation of the Galactic Empire, the hyperspace lanes, just as much of the territory from either faction, fell under Imperial control. Now, knowing that hyperspace lanes can be cut off or blockaded, and knowing that the Empire more than likely owns most of the hyperspace lanes during the time of Rogue One, it is, I feel, fair to assume that following an attack on a major Imperial base, one of the first responses the Empire would take is to blockade any and all hyperspace lanes leading away from Scarif in order to cut off retreating rebel forces. 
As such, Tantiv IV, no doubt being fully aware that this would be the Empire's response, would not take this route, and instead be forced to take the road less travelled. Therefore, while as the true J may be correct in calculating an approximate direct travel of 10 hours, it must be factored in that while having to take smuggler and pirate routes, or even having to undertake the extremely dangerous task of plotting their own course, all the while avoiding any and all Imperial presence, having been marked as, what we can only assume, one of the galaxy's most wanted ships, Tantive Four more than likely took a route that was far from direct. Knowing this, I submit that the events that followed Rogue One were likely as follows. Tantive Four began its possibly month-long journey through the Outer Rim on its way to Tatooine, all the way most likely engaging in cat and mouse encounters with Imperial forces and pirate forces alike. All the while, the Devastator simply sat there waiting for repairs and replacement crew members, during which Darth Vader likely tortured surviving rebels in an attempt to find the final destination intended for Tantive IV. Once learned, the Devastator had to simply get to Tatooine before Tantive IV, which was, for them, an easy task because they, unlike the rebels, had available to them the space lanes. And so therefore we're finally brought to the events of A New Hope. Tantive IV arrives in the system, the Devastator immediately moves to intercept it, and the rest is film history. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a little bit different than most of the stuff we've done, but I've been wanting to do Fixtorian stuff for a while, so there'll probably be more of it. So if you liked it and want to see more of it, feel free to subscribe. Until next time, I have been and still am Grim Grindle.